Welcome to Roots of Faith. We're here today in Back Vashery at Our Lady of Peace Church. And it's a beautiful church it like is. out in the cane field. It's like a Gothic cathedral just out. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's very impressive. And I wanted to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the doors and how it looks when, when mm -hmm. you first arrive walking in. Yes, it's very impressive. And then you first see like the angel of silence on there, you know, warning you, be quiet, <laughs> behave yourself. Right, the, the doors do look um, like medieval mm -hmm. doors. The hinges are real suggestive of, of, of a castle. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite interesting. And it is. There's a statue also in the mm -hmm. niche outside. That's uh, Our Lady of Peace statue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was donated by the Savant, Savant family um, here in Vashery. And they actually also donated the organ as well. So that was interesting in that I believe it was under Father um, Barbier. Mm -hmm. He was a good keyboard player mm -hmm. from was. what I understood. And he, he knew that, well, he wanted a more uh, mm -hmm. modern organ yes. because the one they were using was a beautiful sounding pipe organ, mm -hmm. but it needed to be constantly pumped by hand. It's a lot of work. <laughs> right? yeah. So they decided to get something a little more modern and mm -hmm. he asked if anyone wanted to fund it. And mm -hmm. supposedly he was such a good keyboardist, he offered to mm -hmm. play a private concert for whoever would fund it. Yeah. And, and it was- And they the, took him up on it and got did. their private concerts. So. Yeah, so there's a lot of history here. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna um, talk to some of the former pastors okay and just learn a little bit mm -hmm. more about the history of the church here in Bashery. Okay. Hi, we're here today in the choir loft of Our Lady of Peace Church with Father Michael Maselli. And this is just really a beautiful church. I know you've been here about... Um, five years. Five years. Five years. Okay, and so you came... I know it dates from about 1900, Correct. and there's still a lot of the original, like the Spanish tile down the aisle is still original. Correct, yes. And I think the windows are, they go pretty far back as well. But sure. you came here in the middle of a renovation? Right, I arrived here in uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And when I arrived here, uh, they were in the middle of a renovation, a major renovation mm -hmm. of the church. In fact, the, the first uh, several Mm -hmm. uh, months that I was here, Mass was in the community oh, hall. Wow. <laughs> uh, so it was a very interesting experience yeah. to arrive here uh, in the middle of mm -hmm. a renovation because uh, I had never celebrated the Eucharist in the church mm -hmm. and all of a sudden uh, I was in the middle of a renovation and it decided. Difficult. <laughs> it was difficult. It was very difficult. Yeah. It was very interesting, uh, mm -hmm. very exciting in many ways. Yeah. Uh, just a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful church and it a is. wonderful faith of the people. Um, but over the years, and I, I know now why they did some of the things they did mm -hmm. do in the church, because there's, a, like many old churches, there's mm -hmm. a moisture problem. Yes. And so to kind of deal with that, mm -hmm. they did different things, I think, to try to uh, deal with that problem. But what ended up happening, it kind of, uh, the original style of the church, which is mm -hmm. a neo-Gothic type of style, yes. it kind of interrupted, because mm -hmm. the idea for neo-Gothic is to get you to look toward the center and mm, then kind of also to go up. up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in the renovation, uh, I think there was an attempt to try to yeah. recapture that. Mm -hmm. And I think they did a wonderful you know, they job. They did. Of, you of certainly, doing that. your eyes are drawn up as soon as you walk in. Sure. So I know there's a mural that was done. Right. During... And well, uh, some of the things we wanted to keep is some of the old things like the Spanish tile mm -hmm. in the middle aisle uh, yeah. to keep that connection with the past. And mm -hmm. there's also a beautiful mural in the, uh, which is now our uh, reconciliation oh, room. Oh, yes, the Milo. The beautiful uh, Milo mm -hmm. uh, mural of yeah. the baptism of Jesus. So oh. we wanted to, to incorporate that. Mm -hmm. It was where originally the baptistry was you know, in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, so we wanted to make sure that we kept that, that yeah. painting and something significant. And it really works out as a, a beautiful uh, painting when people come in to reconciliation mm -hmm. to see. Uh, you know, the baptism and the beautiful artwork of mm -hmm. Milo, the I baptism do. of Jesus. Being here five years, you're Correct. familiar with the, the community and the congregation. I know it's a very close-knit community. People really identify with sure, that de Vashri. Definitely. Uh, faith and family is uh, very, very important mm -hmm. uh, to the community. Uh, I think the, the beauty of the church, because usually when you come out to a rural area, mm -hmm. your expectation uh, is you're gonna see a small little wooden church. Yeah, like a country church. And uh, mm -hmm. my first initial reaction when I drove up, I said, my goodness, wow. I couldn't <laughs> well, how beautiful mm -hmm. the church is. And it's amazing what they did back in, in, in the early 1900s to build mm -hmm. such a beautiful, magnificent uh, church. 
at the time in the area, and the people uh, in this area mm -hmm. were very poor. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was an expression of the deep faith that the people mm -hmm. had, that they sacrificed greatly. Many of them mm -hmm. participated in helping to build the church. I heard even the children were like pushing right. wheelbarrows. The, uh, and... From the river, bringing mm -hmm. bricks and uh, tile and everything. Mm -hmm. Everybody contributed in any way that they could yeah. to build the church. And I think they've left that legacy mm -hmm. you know, through the years. Uh, and it's still very much part of the community, part of the mm -hmm. people, where the church really is the center mm -hmm. of their lives and the center of the community. And it really showed in the renovation. Um, I heard that was an extensive, like over a million dollars. It was over uh, close to a million and a half dollar wow. renovation. But the amazing thing about it, uh, it's all been paid for. Wow. Which I think <laughs> is a great testament, again, to mm -hmm. the people's uh, faith uh, in the church and their mm -hmm. love of the church mm -hmm. uh, that they were willing to sacrifice uh, and even the renovation. The first church, I know they paid it off quickly with sure. like, within a couple of years. So Definitely, that is uh, amazing. It, and it, it continues to show in the, the people's faith and the way that they uh, mm -hmm. live uh, their lives mm -hmm. and the way that... Uh, they express it uh, and participating in the church and in different ministries here. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here with us Great. today, it's Father Mr. Thank, well, thank you very you. much. Join Catholic Life Television each Sunday for the celebration of the Mass from St. Joseph Cathedral. Share this time in prayer with others while listening to the Word of God and worshiping in the Eucharistic sacrifice. The Sunday Mass is brought to you by the Diocese of Baton Rouge and can be seen at the following times. If you'd like a copy of any of our local programming, please call us at 225-242-0218 or visit our website at catholiclifetv.org. We're in Our Lady of Peace Church in Vachery, and I have with me Father Henry Gotro, who was pastor here for several years and who has done a lot of research recently on Our Lady of Peace Parish and its history and the pastors and just so many things you've um, you've looked up and, and added into your book. You know, you've mm -hmm. done so much work on this book. I, I wanted to mention that um, your book is now available and it's just been published and it's, it's called, uh, what's the official title of it? A History of Notre Dame de la Paix slash A Lady of Peace. Parish, Vachery, right. Louisiana. Which is such a wonderful, comprehensive history about the parish. So let's talk about some of the early days at Our Lady of Peace. It became a parish in the, I think, 1860s about, and it was the federal occupation. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess just to fill in the, the outline of history, uh, it was first a community area served by uh, St. James Parish. Right and occasionally there were apparently masses in what was called the uh, a community grocery store which is probably kind of like a combination grocery and saloon yeah. <laughs> for the times <laughs> but uh in on may the 2nd 1854 uh father martin gene martin from saint james represented uh Archbishop Blanc in purchasing the first little tract of land mm -hmm. on which was to be built uh, the first chapel and the, and the cemetery location. Right. And that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then in 64, as you were, were referring to, the, uh, there was the first pastor name for an independent parish. Uh, and uh, it was always dedicated in honor of Our Lady, Our Lady of, Peace. of Peace. And Father Duval, I think, was yes. the first Aug resident Augustine pastor Duval. here. Yeah. All right. And uh, over the years, most of the pastors were French, mm -hmm. with the exception of one Spaniard and one Dutchman, until Monsignor Becknell, or rather Father Becknell, became mm -hmm. pastor in 1949. Yeah. So... Right, so it was very much indebted to what we might think of as missionary priests from right. from Europe. Yeah, yeah. Some of those early priests or seminarians who came over and finished their studies yes. here and then became priests, and that that's really interesting. But well, the uh, 
site for the chapel was an area that was settled beginning about 1831, 32, mm -hmm. probably these uh, landowners acquired land under the preemption law. So it's kind of a, like you squatted on it and then you claimed it under mm -hmm. this law. But they seem to have a, a community spirit that they really uh, got together and, uh, you know, began to create the roots of the, the early road system through mm -hmm. with the idea that they would eventually be able to be uh, connect that little local road what is now 644 mm -hmm. part of it uh, they called it then the the front lane or the Manche de Vent mm -hmm. with a route to the river yeah and uh, that was a big part of the struggle for these people because uh, the uh, this area where the church is today is about seven miles back from the riverfront. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there was no connection. Of course, the Mississippi River was the major highway for right. the time. Transport. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get there, to get their produce there, or to do whatever travel they needed to do, uh, they had to pass through private property. And much of that, of course, was owned by uh, I guess you'd say the wealthy planters right, along land the riverfront. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they didn't want uh, their quality agricultural property to be interfered with by a road. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the, right. how it would affect the fences and everything. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but nevertheless, these people needed, badly needed an outlet. Right, to sell their A link their to the Mississippi products. River. Yeah. And so, uh, I think it was in about 1849 that the legislature first authorized a road, mm -hmm. but the, uh, there was opposition from the planners, in particular from um, Madame Lecoul, who was in, in charge at that time of what is today Laura Plantation. Mm -hmm. And twice she went to court and got injunctions to stop the police jury from proceeding with the, the road building activities. Yeah. Uh, but actually a road was first uh, built later referred to as the Old Vashery Road. And when the local people discovered how the route was to be uh, set, uh, 50 of them signed a petition saying this won't work because it's going through the swampy area and when there's a big rain, it's gonna be underwater. It's, it's impassable. Not, not practical, but. Right. It's, it's already a very I, water connected area. But, but again, I think, you know, because of the political influence of the planners, that was and maybe, the road. Uh, Roman in particular at that time. Uh, so within about five years, uh, they were beginning political efforts to get the road they needed from the beginning, which was not really provided for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a lawyer from the actually the other side of, of the river, from around convent, uh, was a big help to them. Mm -hmm. Felix Pierre Poche and. Uh, but <clears throat> twice, uh, Madame Lacou got injunctions to try, try to stop it. And eventually, uh, what had began as an effort to have a road in about 1849 was accomplished by about 1873. That's a long time. A road which, by the standards of that time, was considered a good road. Right, a decent road. So mm -hmm. tell us about some of the pastors who were here during that time of the struggle. Well, one I find most interesting would be the second pastor, uh, uh, Jean-Marie Ravoir, because uh, he came over, he volunteered to come in response to a request that uh, the, the uh, Archbishop of New Orleans had actually gone to Europe to appeal for priest. To Mission come. priest, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he came over in uh, what has been called, I think, the floating seminary. And there were seven parishes added. This is... Uh, you might say right towards the, right at, after the Civil War was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, he served first as an, as an assistant over at St. James. And then in 1866, after uh, Father Duval left, uh, the bishop told him that he would be pastor here. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was still the little chapel Mm -hmm. Then, when Father Duval left, there was still a, some kind of administrative linkage. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
I don't think it ever lost its identity as a separate parish. But the bishop told him that he also wanted him to uh, be pastor for a new chapel on the riverfront. Ah. And uh, that became a problem. He tried to, uh, you know, get support from the people, come up with the money to pay for the building and so forth. And the people here in, in what was then called Bagvashri uh, resisted that. Right. Wow. And, and the, uh, the uh, church wardens of the local chapel community said, you know, that's not a good idea. That will cause conflict and division. Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of, of the feeling was that why should we help those people up front who didn't want us to have a road that we needed, right. you know, to uh, build yeah. their, their building up there. Right. And a there was a strong feelings. kind of a distinct difference in terms of social class and Mm -hmm. uh, economic but wealth and so forth and interest. Right. And so basically the people of this uh, area would not support it. So it became an initiative of the pastor, then pastor at St. James. Mm -hmm. And he actually built, uh, paid for the material for the uh, little chapel. The uh, Riverfront Chapel later became what is today St. Philip Parish. Yeah. But they... Uh, tore down a building on a plantation mm -hmm. for which I think they paid $50 for the timber and put it on a barge and the barge was towed to the site by a steamboat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that chapel was built in 1866 mm -hmm. uh, without probably much of any support from the people here. Right. In the meantime, uh, Father uh, Revoir had begun exploring the adjacent territory further inland and he uh, went by boat over Lake des Almond to Upper La First Parish and uh, really would have preferred a second chapel to be located back there. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the bishop's idea, yeah. the archbishop's. But as a result, he did end up uh, going to uh, minister to the people at Chack Bay, which is now in the next diocese of mm -hmm. And yeah. for a number of years, the priests from here in Vashri right. provided Minister. ministry in yes. those upper the first areas. Mm -hmm. And I think during that time, um, the chapel, the population here was growing some and the chapel yeah. was small. They had to replace yeah. the chapel. In about 14 years, uh, I think in 1868, they built mm -hmm. a larger wooden building here. Right, and I think the population continued to grow and over the next 20 years or so, some they started thinking about maybe mm -hmm. building a, a bigger church. Yes, so, um, and so let's talk when, about the preparation for, um, for when that. When Father Megan Palmer came, uh, he realized that a, a new church would be needed. Mm -hmm. Also, they had to acquire additional land on mm -hmm. which to build it. And uh, at his own expense, he purchased in his name, but you know, knowing that it would be for the diocese eventually, uh, two lots of land. Mm -hmm. Then he uh, apparently commissioned to leading New Orleans architects to design what is essentially this building we're in today. Yeah, it, it's such a beautiful building. It's so striking when you come driving through the cane fields to see it on the outside and surely it must have been the same for people in that day when it was first mm -hmm. built, you know. It's, um, it's a beautiful brick structure and I understand the tower was supposed to be taller than it yes, is. Yes, it should have had a tall spire but Apparently, they, they decided at some point the uh, foundation of the bell tower that is existent was not strong enough to support something. Right. It could be that today with different materials, it might be more feasible. I don't know that. Maybe so. <laughs> it's beautiful as it is uh, that there are some um, of the Spanish influence in the church now. But, the, and the, the architectural style is apparently typical of neo-Gothic in rural France. Mm -hmm. But uh, Father Palma was from uh, Mallorca, which is Spanish territory, and he did go to Spain and acquire some of the materials. Mm -hmm. And uh, in about 1897, I think, he brought over three Spanish workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was interested that I had located 
a list of ship's passengers that identified who they were. Yeah, that's early. So, that's interesting. And, uh, to be able to find them is, is fascinating. But, uh, I think the, it's generally considered that the basic construction was completed by 1902. Mm -hmm. But then uh, two years later, when all the debt was paid, there was this uh, very uh, important ritual of, de of consecration. Yes. And at that time, uh, this was one of only four churches in the state of Louisiana that were consecrated. I'm sure that was really a big honor mm -hmm. and so special to the people And here. at the same time, the, the new rectory, uh, which now serves as the administrative building, mm -hmm. was, uh, was, was completed. Constructed, yeah. They had a very uh, grand celebration with an amazing uh, menu, you know, for the meal that they had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as, as time went on, um, Let's talk about some of the changes that happened to the church and what's, um, and what's there now. It's just a little bit about the beautiful stained glass windows that there are five of them in the, um, behind the altar. Yes, yeah, so those were uh, installed when uh, Father Becknell was pastor in the, the 50s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that he had become aware of the firm that produce these because they had done some work at St. Agnes where he had been before coming here. Right, that's conic, I think, glass yeah, out of Charles Boston. Charles Conic. Mm -hmm. What's really uh, distinctive is that Charles Conic had gone to France and he had made a special study of the techniques used in creating stained glass in, in 13th century, yeah. in other words, in the medieval time. Mm -hmm. And apparently that appealed quite a bit to uh, Monsignor, to the later Monsignor mm -hmm. uh, Becknell. But so yeah. he is the one responsible for the, the uh, pictures, that stained yeah. glass that are there. And you know, they're, they're very beautiful. And of course the, the altar, the whole um, front altar has been changed so much after Vatican II, there were a lot of changes mm -hmm. that needed to be made. And- um, Well, he had to remove the altar and the rereardo behind it so that that central window would be visible. Right, right. It doesn't make and sense so, to make such a beautiful and, window. And and apparently, then yes, I guess in response to uh, the, the differing norms with Vatican II, you know, he and uh, Father Elaine after him, mm -hmm. uh, especially or, or, uh, must have removed uh, uh, quite a bit of traditional statuary from the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Right I there. know that was obviously controversial when that was done. Yeah. Father Elaine took the altar rail that used to be in the church and incorporated it in the new railings uh, in, for the second level of the rectory building. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's preserved. That's a good thing. And, and um, we do, uh, there, the old presider chair is still here, right? Yes. But the um, pulpit is a new, but it incorporates something old, right? Yes, the uh, plaque with a, a scriptural reference mm -hmm. is from the uh, previous lectern that was there. So it's really nice. Because in the old days, they had one of these very high pulpits, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that has not been here, I'm sure, for quite a, a while. Right. Uh, I, I guess uh, just referring back to uh, Father Palma for just a moment and then tying in again with something about Father Becknell. The two times when the uh, parish really became something of a, of a center for education. Uh, about 1890, Father Palma was very concerned about the lack of educational opportunities here. Right. Apparently the local school had not been staffed with a teacher for a year or so. So he actually undertook to provide schooling from about 1890 to 94 under the St. James Parish School Board. Wow. And uh, was somewhat accountable to them. Mm -hmm. And then later it became more, I think, uh, more definitely just a parish school. Mm -hmm. And there were and some uh, sisters, right, who well, came to- Well, in 1902, uh, he invited Immaculate Conception sisters uh, to staff the school and they worked at that until 1915 and it seems like the school continued for a few years but probably with lay teachers and maybe dwindling enrollment and the records on that are not you know right so definite yeah they're not so yes yeah, available but then uh, 
and the time of, Mons of Monsignor Becknell, I keep wanting to call him that, he was only that later. Right. Uh, the uh, Archdiocese of New Orleans had a concern because in this vicinity you have like 70 miles of church territory where there was not one Catholic school. Right, no Catholic school. And so under the uh, confraternity of Christian doctrine system that they used to have, mm -hmm. they arranged for the old convent that the Immaculate Conception Sisters had formerly occupied mm -hmm. to be altered, uh, renovated, and uh, sisters from an order based in Merrill, Wisconsin, the uh, Sisters of Mercy of the Holy Cross, Mm -hmm. came and they used the convent here at Abashery as a base for reaching out to, uh, I think, more or less what is the cluster territory today of St. James, St. Philip, and here at Our Lady of Peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're especially concerned with the education, religious education of, of black children. Mm -hmm. And uh, in time, they also got very involved with ministry to all the parishioners, the whites also in those parishes. Right. And then as this apostolate developed, uh, other sisters came. And uh, later they had a second base for ministry outreach from Luling, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And they were actually uh, here in this area and in Luling uh, for about 31 years. Yeah, so they really uh, contributed a great deal a great to religious education. Yeah. And was, I think, under their influence that uh, uh, a young boy named Terry Steib, who came from a very humble family here. Was in Our Lady in, of Peace Parish. Yes, was encouraged in his vocation, and uh, he was obviously someone very uh, capable, mm -hmm. you know, with really great leadership ability and he got education. He attended a seminary uh, conducted by the Society of the Divine Word. And uh, today he is the Bishop of Memphis. Right, that, so. that is such a fabulous story. And his, um, Bishop Stibe's brother made a couple of um, art pieces for the church or wood Woodworking. Yes, I think some things, uh, the poor box and something I think connected with uh, St. Vincent de Paul activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much for sharing your memories and your knowledge and if people want to know the whole story they should probably get a copy of your book. Or... Well, they will certainly uh, encounter more details that's right. <laughs> about a number so, of things. Thank you so much. It's been a really interesting day here at Our, Our Lady of Peace. It's been fascinating, all the stories, you know, over, well, 200 years of history and... Right, well, mm -hmm. uh, outside there is a cemetery mm -hmm. and it has been here since the beginnings of the parish from the time of the first chapel, right? Mm -hmm. When they bought the land originally for the chapel, they planned for a cemetery at the same time. So it, it dates to like the 1850s, yeah. so. And there are a couple of former pastors who uh, or, are or mm -hmm. were buried mm -hmm. there, right? Father Elaine is buried there, and there's a memorial to Father Jewel. Because so he was once buried in the cemetery. He was once buried here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is also a mausoleum mm -hmm. now there. And in the 1970s, I think they added that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And Father Gotra was telling us how closely people who were born here or spend mm -hmm. their childhood here uh, feel a tie to Our Lady of Peace, that mm -hmm. a lot of them want to come back and have um, their funerals here mm -hmm. be buried in the Our Lady of Peace yeah, Cemetery. I mean, no so. matter how long they've been away, they still want to come back. Yeah, the there's just a lot of solidarity and mm -hmm. a, a lot of faith here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. It is. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today at Our Lady of Peace Church in Bashery. Mm -hmm.